All right, so as I think Martin just said, I'm Patrick. I manage our data center product line at Atlassian. And Martin asked me to come and spend a little bit of time giving everyone here an update on some of the investments that we're making across our server and data center product lines, um, give a bit of insight into where we're going with those product lines and how we're helping teams build better products using the Atlassian tools. There's a lot to cover in here. I think actually this full deck uh, is like 93 slides or something like that, which is just, <laughs> don't worry, we won't do all of that. Um, but just to kind of help figure out how to guide, uh, guide through that, how many people here have seen the server data center keynote from Summit about a month ago? Anybody? One per, okay, two people. <laughs> okay, maybe we do have to go through all of it. Uh, all right, so this is a combination of announcements we made about a month ago. Uh, plus a couple new things that have uh, come onto the table even since then, and a couple special things for Martin here. And when we think about, uh, uh, you sort of look inside of our server and data center product lines and what we've been focused on for the last year or so, it's really all about scale. And when we talk about scale, we talk about that really in two, two different dimensions. One is scaling teams, right? As organizations, uh, sort of continue to adopt agile delivery practices for software development and IT service management and all kinds of other things inside of the organizations. Um, helping more teams that are working in an agile fashion work together is a big focus of ours, right? Uh, and then as more teams inside of larger organizations start to adopt agile practices, they put more load on the tools that they're using to implement those agile practices. And so that creates performance and stability and scalability challenges for the tools themselves as well as for our admins. So we also spend a bunch of time thinking about how it is we can make sure that those tools are always scaling to meet the needs of our customers uh, and helping the admins scale their times as well to manage those tools. So we're going to use these two lenses uh, to talk through some of the investments that we're making uh, across server and data center. <clears throat> so we'll start with teams, and we'll focus first on scaled agile. So from an Atlassian perspective, when we think about uh, scaling agile inside of an organization, um, that usually starts with a team context. You know, we oftentimes see individual teams downloading a set of tools, changing uh, a set of work practices so that they can be more agile in how they deliver on their backlog of work, right? Uh, and then inside of an organization, other teams start to do the same thing. And eventually, you have larger projects that span multiple teams that are working in agile, uh, agile ways. Uh, and they have a different set of needs that are necessary in order to just successfully deliver projects in an agile fashion across a bunch of different teams. And then increasingly, particularly over the last few years, we're seeing uh, sort of the next phase of this evolution. Entire organizations, whether it's a business unit or an entire company, entire enterprise, trying to figure out how they can be more responsive to their customer needs, how they can uh, be more agile in how they uh, make and measure the bets, uh, their, uh, the business bets that they're making as an organization. And so they're trying to figure out how they can adopt agile practices uh, at a broader level inside the organization. And so uh, the work that we've been doing sort of in this area focuses on those two transitions. Um, so we'll start with from sort of a, a team that's working in an agile fashion to a team of teams that works in an agile fashion. And what we see is that there's a new set of requirements that come to the table when this dynamic happens inside of an organization. And those are around cross-project visibility, um, surfacing dependencies, being able to manage dependencies, being able to uh, share with stakeholders sort of an instantaneous view of everything that's happening inside of that project for tracking purposes and so forth. And our primary tool for this is Portfolio for JIRA. Um, and we've been spending a bunch of time over the last year or so uh, revamping that tool. Uh, about a month ago, we released Portfolio 3.0. And uh, actually, real quick, how many people here have used our portfolio tool? Anybody? Oh, that's like two people. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, all right. The, um, the promise of this tool is sort of a, a bit of a difficult one, right? It's to take uh, all the information from a handful of teams that sort of organically grew up working in an agile way, have a different maybe set of practices around that, different ways of measuring how they get their work done and reporting that back up, and aggregating that into some sort of centralized quantitative type view. And this is a tool that we've had out for several years. And one of the things that um, we've been hearing from our customers over and over and over and over again um, is that the primary users of this tool, whether it's a product manager, a program manager, project manager, um, like 
What they want is more instantaneous uh, value from the tool. Download it, install it, and they want to be able to immediately gather a bunch of work from a bunch of different teams and put that into one centralized, almost like tactile view, okay? So that they can see how the work relates from one team to another to deliver a project. Uh, and then so that they can uh, understand those dependencies that exist when there are problems, they can resolve those dependencies from this one centralized uh, tactile view, moving schedules around, backlog priorities, things like that. Have those changes immediately propagate out to the different teams that are rolling their work up into this view. Um, and that's essentially what we've done with Portfolio 3.0. It's almost a new product at this point. Um, we've built an entire new UI experience around it. Uh, it gives you the ability to group work into different swim lanes, see those dependencies that we're talking about, drag them around and manipulate them, uh, and have those changes propagate out to the different teams that are working on that project. Um, this type of view also gives you a really simple way of sharing with stakeholders a live view of what's going on with a particular project. Um, and as a product manager, one of the things that's been exciting for us over the last few months, we've had this in an early access program for maybe, maybe four or five months now. Um, and the feedback from customers has just been tremendous, right? So if you uh, find yourself in a situation where you have multiple teams that are working together and trying to deliver on projects, uh, this is a really great tool to kind of help see everything that's happening across those tools. I would encourage you to check it out. Now, Portfolio is one tool, and it accomplishes one set of needs um, when you see a group of teams working together on a project. Um, but the reality is that you know, every, every project, every organization works a little bit differently. Uh, and they have a different set of needs um, uh, depending on what it is they're trying to accomplish, right? Uh, reporting, planning, time tracking needs, things like that. And so um, one of the things that we wanted to lean into uh, this year is to make it easier for you to pull together a solution from sort of the ecosystem of capabilities that exist around tools like Jira uh, to sort of fill the gaps in the ways that your teams need to work in order to deliver projects in a seamless and agile sort of way. So we launched an Agile at Scale Marketplace, um, which basically is a curated set of applications when you have you know, needs uh, that need to be met across a set of teams trying to deliver a project, you can go here uh, and take a look at how other organizations are meeting those needs and then uh, sort of bolt on additional applications and customize them to the way that your organization works. So as we scale up further and we start talking about uh, larger organizations, um, <clears throat> adopting uh, agile practices across like huge numbers of people. There's like yet another layer of challenge that gets introduced here, right? When you have multiple uh, projects, you know, rolling up into multiple portfolios of work, uh, there's a different sort of reporting and alignment challenge that comes into play. You have to be able to aggregate this information up uh, in a way that actually makes it useful for uh, executive business leaders to tell what's going on to give them actionable information so they can figure out, well, here's the direction we want to go as an organization. So we're going to make kind of a resource bet in that direction. Uh, and then have that information be communicated back down to individual contributors across the organization so that everyone knows how it is that their work connects to that overall mission of the organization. Uh, and then give, you know, basically tight alignment sort of, thanks, Jimena. <laughs> can stop yelling at everybody now. Um, tight alignment from a vertical perspective as well as from a horizontal perspective uh, across many teams inside the organization. And uh, Atlassian's made a big bet in this direction. Uh, recently, we acquired a company called Agile Craft um, that focuses on implementing some of the more uh, common Agile frameworks across large organizations that are looking at enterprise-scale Agile transformations. And so they provide a set of tools that help with that kind of alignment and visibility, as well as practices to help organizations make the cultural and way of work shifts that are necessary for those types of transformations to be successful. Um, that company you'll hear us refer to as Jira Align. All right? So this is, as I understand it internally, one of the easiest rebrands we've ever done as a company. It's sort of the term Jira Align just sort of like sprung to the lips of one of our marketing uh, people and everyone was like, you know, that's perfect because it really kind of captures this sense of driving alignment, you know, from the top to the bottom within an organization and then sort of horizontally across lots of different teams that are doing that work. 
So uh, if you're the type of organization that you know, is asking questions like, how do we make sure that you know, a large swath of teams understands how it is that their work is connected to the overall sort of mission of the organization? And how is it that we you know, get some, some measurements across those different teams uh, uh, and roll those up into actionable information for executive business leaders to be able to make intelligent choices about kind of where the company is going and to be able to get more rapid feedback on whether you're being successful uh, with those missions. Uh, this is a great tool to check out. There's a tiny little website down here, goagilecraft.com slash align demo. Uh, they have a really interesting live demo that they run. I think it's once a week um, that's worth checking out. Now, when we acquired AgileCraft, they had all kinds of really cool customer stories. I pulled most of them out just for time, but I thought some of the numbers in this one were, were interesting to, to share. Uh, this is an example with AT&T. It's a really big legacy telecommunications company uh, in the United States. Um, and they worked with AgileCraft on this, uh, uh, this Agile transformation journey. And um, at the time this story was written, they were about six months into that process. And they had transitioned 15,000 people into an agile way of working uh, across 45 release trains, 15 portfolios, and sort of phase one of this broader project. And I think that's just super cool to sort of see that type of transition at a larger, like well-established uh, company as they try to figure out how to work in more modern ways to satisfy their customers' needs. OK. so. Agile IT or uh, Enterprise ITSM is another area that Atlassian's been spending uh, a lot of time uh, recently. And our primary product in this is uh, Jira Service Desk. Okay, How many here have heard of Jira Service Desk? OK, good. That's better than use. All right, how many actually use Jira Service Desk? Uh, that's pretty good. It's like 40% wow, like or so. OK. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so Jira Service Desk is a really uh, interesting product from my perspective. It was one of those things that I think surprised us from a success perspective. It was originally intended just to be like a, a simpler interface to technical teams so that uh, people outside those technical teams didn't have to deal with some of the complexity of, of JIRA in order to submit tickets into that team. And um, we were, you know, uh, clearly targeting like the IT market in particular. So IT service management giving IT teams the ability to have a service desk uh, either internally within their organization or externally to customers uh, that would give them the ability to have sort of a better ticketing type of agile delivery experience. And one of the things that surprised us with this is that we made it, Jira Service Desk makes it so easy to create service desks, these, these ticketing front ends, that uh, like all kinds of sub organizations within a company started creating their own service desks, right? So we see this inside of Atlassian. There's this proliferation of service desk interfaces across like our analytics teams and our legal teams and our HR teams and like like you name it. Now you have to figure out what service desk you're going to. Um, and so like I think that sort of speaks to the power of um, <clears throat> how organizations as a whole, even beyond just core software teams, are trying to figure out how to work in in more agile ways to be more efficient and more responsive to uh, the needs of their particular customers, internal or external. And so all that starts with, uh, with that front interface, that portal experience that your customers have if you're sort of an agent sitting behind a service desk instance. And so we've spent some time recently trying to improve that portal experience, making it more brandable for you so that it's recognizable uh, to your customers when they show up. Another thing we've done is we have, uh, slide notes here say, strategically placed a search bar for your customers, which really just means we put it right smack dab in the middle of the landing zone when your customers uh, hit this page. And the idea here is that self-service is a much better solution for everyone involved if you can make it happen, right? Um, you don't want to have your customers creating tickets if you can avoid it. Uh, and so encouraging them to search uh, has been a focus of ours. We've also made some changes under the covers uh, to make it so that knowledge, ha like knowledge bases sort of the, the search function taps into are more front and center and that they do, they do a better job of surfacing for end users, like the information that they would uh, potentially want to be interacting with. Uh, and so the whole goal here is just to reduce the probability that a, uh, a customer needs to raise a ticket in order to solve a particular problem. And of course, once they do, uh, 
uh, there's a, we've done a bunch of work behind the scenes to increase the productivity of, of the agents behind the portals who have to deal with those tickets when they do get submitted. Um, so there's a whole bunch of like little things, ways that we've been able to sort of uh, improve their ability to get work done faster. Now, ITSM specifically is about more than uh, just dealing with help desk tickets and so forth. It's also about managing incidents. Uh, and this is another big area where Atlassian as a whole uh, believes we can really help uh, customers do a better job with this. Uh, than they have in the past. And so we've been leaning into this. You may have noticed last year we acquired two companies, Ops Genie and uh, Status Page, to help out with incident management. Um, Ops Genie is a tool that helps you manage sort of the workflows of dealing with incidents inside the organization. And Status Page uh, gives you a portal where you can always tell your customers what's going on and avoid some of the point to point communications that happen whenever you have service outages and things like that. So uh, from a uh, an Atlassian server and data center perspective, one of the things that we've focused on for the last six months or so is creating tight, seamless integrations with these two tools here. Right? And the idea here is that we want to make it really, really easy as your uh, IT teams like resolve incidents, uh, incidents for the information to be kind of seamlessly shared back and forth across Jira Service Desk, Jira, um, you know, Status Page, Ops Genie, uh, to sort of like make that experience much more streamlined. One other thing to point out about these tools is they are SaaS-based products, right? And so one of the advantages to having a SaaS-based architecture for incident management is that when those incidents affect your core tools themselves, maybe even your service desk, or the network that sits between your customers and your service desk, you still have a way of communicate, uh, communicating with your customers, uh, kind of what's going on. And a little bit more generally, integration's been a big theme for us in the IT service management space, right? Kind of like what we talked about with the uh, Agile software delivery bit uh, a few slides ago. Like, organizations have different needs for how it is that they deal uh, with their IT service management and how those teams, those teams operate. And so uh, there's a whole bunch of different tools that you can use, that you can add on and sort of flexibly extend our tools to make sure that um, they can meet those needs. And so we've been focused on making sure that we have really tight integrations with those so you have a more elegant experience. And that's, of course, extends beyond just tools like Ops Genie and Status Page that are Atlassian tools. It also includes third-party uh, marketplace tools as well. Uh, and this is an area where you'll see us continue to make more investments to make more and more kind of streamlined experiences here. All right, and of course, <laughs> uh, none of this scaled Agile and Agile IT stuff would be possible uh, for us as a company at Atlassian if we didn't continue to focus on uh, moving the ball forward for our core software developer uh, kind of cohort. Um, and so this is an area of investment for us. If you, if you take a look at like a modern software development workflow, essentially, we focused for the last uh, year or so on a couple different areas there, in particular trying to improve the experience for, for developers. So uh, the first area is in committing and pushing changes to the code base. Uh, and here, it's largely about um, visibility. Uh, and so the first thing that we've done is try to make it easier for you to see, to like basically as a developer, visualize uh, the different commits that are happening uh, to your main code branch, where they're coming from, why, how they're related to one another. And so we've released a capability called a commit graph, which is like the second most voted feature, I think, in, uh, for all, maybe all of Bitbucket history. Um, and this gives developers exactly that. You can, you can see at a glance, oh, here we go, one more slide. You can see at a glance um, uh, a graph of different commitments that have happened and really easily kind of see how those are related to uh, individual commits from, from individuals across your organization. And of course, the reason for this is to avoid things like merge conflicts. And so we've released another capability, Git LFS file locking, um, which is just like what it sounds. It gives your developers the ability to lock individual files while they're working on that so other developers can see which files are being uh, worked on and also prevent uh, changes to those files until uh, you as a developer unlock that file. Right, so as we move on forward to in the developer workflow to build results, uh, this is all about speed, right? If you're a developer, you finish a bit of work, you check it in, you don't want to have to wait forever for the results to come back so that you can move on to the next task. And uh, 
to help with this, we've recently introduced a new capability called Smart Mirror Farms for Bitbucket Data Center. Now, this builds on top of a cap. Uh, hopefully, this slide doesn't overbuild on me. We'll see. Builds on top of the uh, Smart Mirrors capability that we introduced last year. Right? And so, the story here is really, uh, really about uh, your distributed teams. If you have sort of a home base of development in one particular place, and you have maybe a cluster of Bitbucket machines, but then you have development centers that live in other regions of the world. Um, Smart Mirrors gave you the ability to stand up a mirror of the home repo that your developers could interact with locally. So they have a much faster, snappier experience. Um, and then it was uh, checking code out, checking code in. And then it was responsibility of that mirror to stay in sync with, with the, home, uh, the home base. What we saw, though, was with individual mirrors uh, located in these, uh, these remote locations, large teams or teams that have a heavy dependence on CI, CD would put so much load on top of a single machine that it would cause performance problems. And they're sort of back to, back to square one in terms of the performance challenges that caused them to uh, create these, uh, these smart mirrors in the first place. So the smart mirror farms concept that we're introducing now gives you the ability to stand up a cluster of smart mirrors so that you can handle as much load as you need to in these remote locations. All right, so that's a bit about how we're helping teams scale, how we're seeing organizations have more and more and more and more teams uh, of different types uh, start to try to work in a more agile fashion using uh, some of the Atlassian tools and helping them uh, do that and manage some of the new needs that are introduced as those teams try to work together. And of course, all that affects the infrastructure, like I said earlier, creates some scale and manageability challenges. And so we spend a ton of time um, trying to make sure that uh, the tools are able to keep up. Uh, and for us, this is a story largely about admins. Right? As we talk to admins and we, we hear some of their pain and we try to meet that with new capabilities in the products, uh, we see the world of the admin sort of evolving increasingly rapidly uh, into a world that's more automated, more integrated, and more, more data-driven. Uh, so we'll kind of talk through these different lenses here. Uh, from an automation perspective, uh, you sort of look around you. This is generally true across the world. You look around you, and like routine daily tasks are just kind of disappearing. Yeah, everything's connected to the internet. Your thermostat regulates itself. You never have to touch it anymore. Your car can drive itself in some cases. And we see similar things with IT tools, particularly in the realm of deployment automation. Right? As more organizations uh, migrate to tools like AWS and Azure, uh, they're able to uh, uh, take advantage of automation, automating away certain tasks that previously weren't possible for them. So a couple examples of this type of thing that we hear often are things like uh, backing up, pointing the wrong way. Um, yeah, automating your data backup systems so that if there's ever a failure, you're covered, you still have all your data you can recover. Um, Automating your, uh, your system so that it, it starts extracting logs automatically from your system whenever your monitoring tools detect that there may be a challenge. And this third example is definitely my favorite one, uh, on-demand JIRA. Basically giving your teams the ability to push a button and have an entire new instance of JIRA spun up for them if they have like a temporary project they're working on or they need to work with a custom workflow and that sort of thing. And uh, we're seeing more and more of of this type of thing from our customers uh, over the last few years as they lean into migration, migrating their tools up to uh, cloud providers like AWS and Azure and Google. In fact, uh, more than 35% of our data center instances today are deployed on one of the major cloud providers. So this is a trend that we've been leaning into over the last six months. We have uh, updated every single one of our deployment templates for AWS and Azure for all of our data center, our core data center products. So Jira Software, Jira Service Desk, Confluence, and Bitbucket. Uh, and so what we've been trying to do is make these templates simpler to set up and easier to customize for the way that your organization deploys on top of uh, these platforms, AWS and Azure. Um, and one of the things that you'll see, if this is your style of deployment, and when you dig into these templates, you'll see that we've started unlocking specific infrastructures as service capabilities uh, from these cloud uh, platform providers. There's two of those that we'll give you examples of here today. The first one's in the realm of high availability. So this is sort of the core uh, promise, uh, maybe the original core promise of the data center product line when we launched it uh, five years ago, if you can believe it's been that long. Um, 
we've been going after areas of downtime, uh, right? And so when we first launched, we went after the primary area of downtime with the clustered application architecture, right? So data center gives you the ability to stand up multiple nodes that are all active. If one node has an issue, your users don't necessarily know that, and they can continue to get their work done. Um, then we went after planned downtime. Did I get this right? No, sorry. Then we went after planned downtime and um, <clears throat> introduced zero downtime upgrades for Jira software and Jira service test data center and read-only mode for Confluence data center, right? And the next step for us is to get down to the database layer, okay? And so what we're doing is we're introducing support for our first highly available database with Amazon Aurora uh, across all of your data center products. Now this, uh, well, I should mention also that um, uh, Aurora is going to be, you'll see that when you look at these templates, you'll see that it's, it's implemented as like a really simple single line configuration option in those templates. So it's really easy to get up and running with an HA database uh, now using those templates. Now the other infrastructure capability I wanted to talk about is around performance for your distributed teams. Okay, and you know the story here, all right? Um, this example is from uh, a customer we spoke to a few months ago who's telling us that uh, it takes nearly four times as long for JIRA actions to complete for their users in Japan as it does for their users in Europe. And we were joking on the phone, this is, it's kind of like forcing their users in Japan to log in via like a, an old internet dial-up connection. Um, and they were just getting root, like complaints every single day from the users in Japan. And so um, this, is, this type of dynamic is something that we're working to, to improve um, you know, performance for your distributed teams. And so to help with that, we're introducing the ability uh, for you to use a content delivery network across your data center products to speed up the experience of those remote users. Now, for those of you who use AWS, uh, you'll see that uh, CloudFront's one of those infrastructure capabilities that we are uh, making really easy to use in those templates. But the reality is that you can use any CDN that you want with your products. You can, if you're entirely behind the firewall, you can also use a reverse proxy to get a similar uh, effect across your distributed, uh, your distributed offices. And you can use that CDN with any one of the core data center products. So Jira Software, Jira Service Desk, Bitbucket, and Confluence. So if you dive into that just a little bit more, um, how, how exactly does a CDN, a, a content delivery network, help remote users? Um, this is one of my, I used to work at Akamai. This is like one of my favorite topics to go into. Um, so CDN, uh, what it does is it caches and delivers static page assets from a location that's closer to your end users, which really does two things for you. One is it makes that experience that your users have with the UI much snappier, right? It accelerates performance from their perspective. And then particularly during peak times, it offloads your primary application instances as well so that they perform better in general. So if you dig under the covers um, uh, and you were to look at what it takes to load a JIRA issue, you'd see that about 80% on average of the request, the client server requests that get made are for static assets of the type that can be delivered uh, by a CDN. And so when we turn on CDN inside of Atlassian, we're seeing that translate to uh, too many clicks. Um, we're seeing that translate to about a 30% performance improvement for our remote teams. For Confluence, we're seeing about a 25% improvement. Now, of course, um, results are going to vary a lot based on things like network latency, client distribution, request load, and so forth. So uh, as the CDN support gets rolled out across the different products, you'll also see us provide some guidance so that you can understand when CDN is most appropriate for you and sort of how to set that up within your network. Uh, now, also on the topic of performance for your distributed teams, another thing that we're doing is enabling HTTP2 uh, support automatically whenever we detect that your network supports that. And with H2 support turned on, um, what we're seeing is an additional 20% performance improvement for remote teams. Okay, so there's, you know, you look at smart mirrors, you look at CDN, you look at H2 support, and um, we're really leaning into this, like, this realization that your organization has just teams that work all over the planet and they want to have a really snappy experience with uh, the products that they use day to day to get their work done. All right, so an increasingly integrated world from an admin perspective. Uh, we talked back kind of in the first section of this deck uh, about all this landscape of IT tools that are used for agile software delivery, modern software development, 
um, Agile IT. And that landscape of tools is growing year over year. Okay? And <clears throat> they get stitched together in sort of customized way. It's like an integration fingerprint for every single organization. And um, uh, I think uh, you know, one of the things from our perspective is to make sure that uh, your Atlassian tools, so they've always been pretty good from an extensibility perspective. You can add lots, there's lots of apps available. You can do custom extensions and so, so on and so forth uh, in order to extend the power of those tools. Um, but sometimes that causes problems, right? Our larger customers tend to have dozens, if not hundreds, of applications, and they can sometimes cause performance and stability challenges and that sort of thing. And so uh, last September, we introduced our data center approved apps program to help with this. Uh, so this is a program where app vendors um, have to go through uh, a set of tests uh, in order to prove that their applications are going to perform reasonably well at scale. Uh, to make sure that they have support contacts available for you. So if you've ever had that experience where you uh, have an issue that you eventually narrow down to a particular application and then you contact that app developer and you just get like crickets, no results or whatever, like that shouldn't happen with data center apps. And we launched this back in September and um, this number is actually uh, low now. I think we have over 380 data center approved apps uh, that we've been able to introduce over the last eight months been a lot of work and we're, we're really proud of that. That represents about 83% of the top apps that our customers use. Um, and the cool thing from my perspective is that in the last few months, we've finally been able to start getting some data back from our customers who are taking advantage of data center approved apps. And we're seeing uh, so far about an 18% reduction in the support cases that they, uh, they log with us uh, as a result of stability and performance improvements from these apps. And so from my perspective, that's a pretty good result for a program that's only seven or eight months old. Um, we have an entire team dedicated to moving this forward. We're going to continue raising the bar, working with vendors to help them deliver higher quality, more scalable, more secure applications for you. Now, uh, while we talk about integrations, um, you know, having uh, DC apps uh, as a program will certainly help improve the quality uh, of, of of the integrations and extensions that you have on your core uh, Atlassian products. Um, but it's not going to be perfect. Like you may have noticed that apps and scripts and power users and things like that, um, that they can sometimes cause performance issues and stability issues with your products. Um, the stories we often hear are things like uh, a rogue app is, you know, like accidentally DOSing your Jira instance or uh, you have a CI CD system that keeps triggering build storms that brings your Bitbucket instance down to a crawl. And so what we hear in these moments from customers is it'd be really nice if your core Atlassian products could protect themselves from this type of automated abuse. Uh, and so it's for that reason that we're introducing a rate limiting capability um, for REST APIs and Bitbucket data center. Right? And so just like it sounds, this gives you the ability as an admin uh, to set the number of requests that an individual user can make in a specified period of time across this particular API. Um, <clears throat> and this solution, like I said, it specifically targets the HTTP API of Bitbucket. But we know that this isn't the only place or product where you experience these types of challenges. Uh, so what you'll see. Uh, uh, from us is a continued investment in more like self-protection mechanisms that extend to other interfaces of the products and then um, we'll spread those across to other products as well. All right, so we're talking about a world that's more automated and more integrated and of course what comes with that is more data, lots and lots and lots of data in fact. Uh, and the thing about that data is that at least for us, it's, it's usually only valuable if we can keep it proprietary and sometimes highly confidential. And so managing that data in that way is one of the jobs of our admins. Um, and sometimes that's not very easy. You know, we hear stories about uh, an admin who discovers that a particular user has access to a page or a space in Confluence, for example, that they, that they shouldn't. And so as an admin, you kind of have to dig in and figure out why, how they got access to that page. Then you have to fix it, and then maybe you worry a little bit in the back of your mind that it might happen again somewhere. Uh, and, and whenever we hear these stories, we would always tell ourselves, like, wouldn't it be great if you could just like, log into a single page somewhere and see all of your different permissions from all of your different users across all of your different Atlassian self-managed products and all the instances you have of those products. It's like all 14 Jira instances that you have, right? 
Um, and so that's the future that we envision for our crowd data center product. Okay. Um, we're looking. Actually, real quick, does anyone here does anyone here know what crowd is, or have you do you use crowd? Actually, better question. Okay, a handful of people. Uh, for those of you who don't know about it, it's our um, uh, it's our tool for uh, managing user access across all of your self-managed uh, Atlassian products today, so your server and data center products today. And we're working to ex uh, basically expand Crowd into more of a full control center for admins. And that'll begin with uh, that'll begin with the uh, the permissions visibility type stuff that we just talked about. Uh, we're also looking into uh, license visibility. So to the extent that you have this like myriad of server and data center licenses that just kind of like crop up across your organization, you'd be able to track those in a central place as well. And of course, it's not just about being able to see permissions. It's also about being able to, to make permission changes across your organization in an intuitive way. And so um, one of the things that you'll see, uh, uh, this is a particular pain for our Confluence customers. And so one of the things that you'll see from us over the coming months uh, is <coughs> uh, the introduction of a new set of, cap sorry, a new set of capabilities uh, for Confluence to make it much easier for admins uh, to manage permissions across their organization. Uh, and there'll be three kind of core capabilities that come along with this. Uh, one is the ability to easily audit page and space access. Uh, another one is the ability to troubleshoot access levels across different groups inside of your organization. Uh, and then finally, the ability to bulk edit space, uh, space and page permissions across the organization. And that's going to, for those of you who've had to do this, you'll, you'll know like this, this is going to save a ton of time having to individually go into pages and spaces and make uh, permissions changes and so on and so forth. All right. So when we talk about admins managing data, one of those responsibilities is to, to maintain that data in a way that makes it, uh, for the users who should have access to it, that makes it easy and fast for those users to find that, uh, that data. Uh, and one of the challenges with that uh, is that, uh, particularly for customers who've been using a tool for an extended period of time or they have a lot of users on a tool, is a lot of old, out-of-date information can sort of like gum up that system and slows down slows it down from a performance perspective, and also makes it more difficult for your users to find particular pieces of information that they're looking for. And so last September, we announced, uh, oops, I got one ahead of myself, sorry. We announced project archiving for Jira Software and Jira Service Desk Data Center. It was like a simple but powerful way that admins could take entire projects that are no longer being worked on and take them out of the Jira index so that it's faster and easier for your end users to find what they're looking for. And when we announced project archiving, we also said that this was the beginning of an arc of work that we had some other ideas for how it is we could help you manage uh, old information inside of your JIRA systems. And so the teams are soon going to be releasing an issue level archiving capability as well. All right? So this allows you to archive individual issues. You know, the reason for that is uh, we heard some feedback, it was, I guess, pretty obvious, but from customers that like archiving whole projects didn't always make sense. A lot of customers have really long-lived projects or really large projects, and they want to be able to archive pieces of projects away. Uh, and for Jira Service Desk, it didn't make as much sense because um, archiving a project was basically the same thing as archiving an entire service desk, and there wasn't a huge use case for that. Um, so now you'll have the ability to archive uh, individual issues. We will release an API with this, so you can do kind of policy-driven archiving, and you won't have to archive you know, thousands of issues by hand. Um, you'll also have the ability to use JQL to uh, gather issues and do bulk archiving actions as well. All right, so we talk about this world of the admin and how it's evolving, automated, integrated, data-driven. Lots of change. Um, at the same time, uh, some of the, the, the uh, sort of core battles that admins face around performance and stability and scalability, um, those are always going to be around. Those are always going to be like kind of front and center in the admin's world. Uh, and so they've been a primary focus for us as well. And you see that primarily in the platform releases that we've been rolling out uh, over the course of about a year. Almost all of our uh, core products have taken a platform upgrade over the last year. And these releases are an opportunity for us to step back, make uh, you know, major architectural changes when, when needed to kind of clean things up and make sure that our customers have a platform that they can depend on for, for years to come. So 
Uh, a, a, one of the big focuses of these has been on performance and stability improvements that we've made across all the different products. And I'm not going to walk through any of those individually um, because there's just like there's too many of them. <laughs> but if you use one of the products, when you see one of these platform releases kind of come out, Jira 8.0, Bitbucket 6.0, like grab the release notes and take a quick look through the top of those release notes, and you're going to see that we have like we've packed these releases with performance and stability improvements. Uh, they're going to make lives a lot better for your end users. Uh, and of course, we introduce all these capabilities because of you, because of how our customers are growing the use of these tools. Um, it's it's really fascinating. Like I like I routinely now talk to customers who add more than a hundred thousand issues to their Jira instance every single month. And when I go back and I talk to architects inside of Atlassian, like it's pretty clear that a few years ago that would have been a pretty scary prospect, right? <laughs> um, but today, it's just it's the new norm, right? We test for instances way bigger than that, right? Uh, but it does beg this really interesting question about where it is our customers are going, OK? Um, and our current expectation is that the, everyone here, y'all, and other customers are going to continue to find more creative ways to use the products. They're going to create more scale and performance challenges for us. And so we're working really hard to stay ahead. And I think my favorite example of that that I like to tell people is we pulled together this crack team of architects from across all of our products, and we gave them this super aspirational mission to 10x the products. Right? They call themselves the DC Next Generation team. Um, they sort of piggyback off the DC universe. Everyone's got like a Batman or Wonder Woman type of, uh, type of avatar. Um, but what they're doing is they're looking at all the dimensions of scale in our products. Issues, pages, spaces, repos, workflows, custom fields, you name it. And they're working to figure out how we can add a zero what we can support today in terms of numbers of, of those things. And that's like a, a super aspirational goal, but it's one that's ultimately driven by um, the use of our products from our customers. So I think we are maybe a little bit over the estimated time here, so I'll kind of wrap this up and spare you the flowery end, ending. But um, you know, like I said, uh, we've been focusing a lot and we'll continue to focus on making sure that organizations can scale, scale the way their teams want to work, and scale the tools underneath the way those teams want to work. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, it's been a really exciting journey for us. Um, I hope that uh, I'll be around later today, and so I hope that I get a chance to talk to to, to some of you and hear uh, some of your stories and how it is that you're using the tools and some of the challenges you're running into and and so on. Uh, and that uh, wraps it up for my presentation. Thank you. stand here and be entertainment for a while until somebody else <laughs> comes and takes the mic from me. So are there any questions? I don't know, questions? There, I will bring you a microphone. Um, on your first slide, uh, you were talking about server and data center. Um, I think there was almost no slide that didn't mention that the feature was for data center. Um, so I'm asking about your internal secret program or initiatives phasing out server in the next years. How is that going? Um, <clears throat> I appreciate a lot that you're um, bringing up the scaling issue, but it might be a problem for us because we're not scaling as fast as Atlassian is. So. Uh, the costs are also scaling <laughs> for use in data centers. So my question is, um, do you still support server? And do you bring also some of those features back to server that you just mentioned? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I, I realized about halfway through this presentation that I wasn't doing a particularly good job of saying, what's in data center and, and what's in server? Um, we can go back through and kind of pick it apart. But uh, maybe half of what we talked about there is in both server and data center, right? Um, generally speaking, anything that's directly for teams, we stick into the server bucket. And then um, things that are designed to help organizations that use the product in a mission critical way. And not necessarily, a, it doesn't have to be a 100,000 person company, right? Like if you're a, if you're a 1,000, 1,500 person company, like downtime is super expensive for you. Your tool goes down for an hour, like how much does that cost you? 
Um, <clears throat> and those types of needs, in addition to other types of like regulated industry needs and so forth, are what we're primarily building into our data center products. And when we do that, when we do build something that's sort of aligned with that uh, type of use case, our intent is for that to stay in data center. And I think you understand like why, right? Like those types of capabilities, like like HA, a cluster deployment model, those are super hard to build, right? And you know, server is a fantastic product. It's super cheap. You know, we can't build all those types of capabilities at, at that particular price point. Um, in terms of specifically what's in server, right? There were a handful of things in there that we talked about directly. Um, but the the other thing is, like, when you go and look at those release notes for those platform releases. Um, you're going to see that the vast majority of work there around performance improvements and things like that are going to be uh, directly applicable to all your server, your, your, your customers who run on top of the server platform. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Take a look. Nobody? Then thank you very much and have a nice house for him. Thanks. <laughs>